Welcome. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine and bulletin service of the air. Here are the stories that are trending as we go to air this week. The Swedish telecommunications regulator is considering charging amateurs a fee to run more than 200 watts. The Hamvention Board of Directors announces its Amateur of the Year, Club of the Year, and other award winners. We will have team coverage. The Federal Communications Commission must act to avoid a grave threat to the global positioning system. The League had an expanded presence at the 2018 Orlando Hamcation, and we will have the details. The ARRL goes heavy metal with the installation of a restored Gates broadcast transmitter converted to the amateur bands. We will tell you all about it. The Arecibo Observatory is now under new management. The largest ham fest in Europe, held in Friedrichshafen, Germany, moves to June this year. And while other shortwave broadcasters are shutting down, one popular station here in the States is installing a new, more powerful transmitter and a new antenna system as well. We will have all the details in this week's report. These headline stories will come to you in a moment, along with this week's special features. We'll visit with Bruce Page, KK5DO, and get an update from AMSAT and what's new with all those amateur satellites in orbit. Our technology reporter, Leo Laporte, W6TWT, will be here with more details on the Spectre processor virus, and we'll talk about MOOCs, massive open online courses that you can take for free. Australia's own Arnold Benshop, VK6FLAB, asks, what improbable antenna solution works best? Our own amateur radio historian, Bill Continelli, W2XOY, will be here with another edition of Amateur Radio History Headlines. All this and a lot more is straight ahead, along with this week's propagation forecast, as edition number 993 of North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine and bulletin service, This Week in Amateur Radio, takes to the air right now. Reporting from the frozen tundra of Albany, New York, where we are bracing for our third nor'easter snowstorm in a row. There's more than three feet of snow outside the studio right now. I'm W2XBS. And reporting from our news bureau in Syracuse, New York, where once again the lake effect snow machine has cranked up, I'm Chris Perrine, KB2FAF. And reporting from the Catskill Mountains, where it's so cold out the robins are freezing to the snow piles, I'm Don Hulick, K2ATJ. And from Studio One in our Central Florida News Bureau, I'm Fred Fitty, November Fox, 2 Fox. 30 minutes of solid amateur radio news begins now. Leading off this week's news comes word that Sweden's Post and Telecom Authority, or PTS, is considering lowering the transmitter output power for general amateur radio stations to 200 watts PEP under a set of wide-ranging proposed regulatory changes affecting many radio services. Radio amateurs who want to run high power would have to apply for a license and pay an annual fee of about $33. Amateur radio licenses were eliminated in Sweden in 2004, and amateur radio in Sweden is permission-free, but prospective radio amateurs still must pass an examination, typically arranged by Sweden's International Amateur Radio Union Member Society in Sweden, SSA. A certificate and a call sign, valid for life, are issued without any future fees. The maximum permitted power on most HF bands is 1 kilowatt. That power would not necessarily be guaranteed under an amateur radio license, and conditions could apply. The PTS's rationale is that requiring a license for radio amateurs who want to run more than 200 watts will make it easier to trace any interference than those transmitters may cause. The matter is widely discussed in Sweden. Henry Kotowski SM0JHF told the ARRL, since there are quite a few opponents to permission-free operation, resulting in their eyes in degradation of quality and discipline on the air, SSA is planning to comment on the proposal. The deadline is March 30th. Beginning our team coverage of the 2018 Hamvention Award winners, we begin with the Amateur of the Year. The Hamvention Awards Committee has announced that Valerie Hotzfeld, 
and V9L of Crescent City, Illinois, is the 2018 Amateur of the Year. The committee, chaired by Michael Calter, WHCI, and Frank Bayafor, WS8B, revealed that Hamvention 2018 award winners this week. The list includes the Club of the Year, the Technical Achievement Award, and Special Achievement Award. We'd like to thank everyone who nominated a candidate, the committee said, in announcing the award recipients. The process is always difficult. First licensed in 2006, Hotzfeld has been very active in the local amateur radio clubs and in Aries. Once she discovered HF, she became obsessed with DXing and contesting. In the past few years, she's enjoyed inviting new hams to her station to DX or to contest, and has been the pilot or lead pilot of four major DXpeditions. Hotzfeld is a co-host of the netcast Ham Nation and has created several how-to videos on YouTube for the ham radio community. She also enjoys giving presentations on various topics via Skype to amateur radio clubs across the U.S. She's currently the treasurer of her contest club and prize chairman for W9DXCC and SMC Fest. In 2017, she became very active in public service, traveling to Texas in the wake of Hurricane Harvey to help rescue small animals. She was subsequently deployed to Puerto Rico with the American Red Cross for three weeks as part of a group volunteer amateur radio operators, facilitating critical communications after Hurricane Maria. Hotzfeld also said that amateur radio has enriched her life because of the challenges and the great friends the hobby brings. Now with details in the Club of the Year Award, we go to NF2F Fred. The Portage County Amateur Radio Service of Rovina, Ohio is Hamvention's 2018 Club of the Year. PCARS was established in November 2005 and is an ARRL-affiliated special service club. PCARS members average more than 40 hours of club activities each month, including special interest groups, licensed training, contesting run from the club site, KBF and club social events. Our members cover a wide range of interests that allow us to support public safety organizations, student outreach programs, and activities focused on growing our hobby, the club told the Hamvention Awards Committee. We love to share our experiences and have a requirement that our events be filled with a lot of fun. Members have joined PCARS because of all the activities and fun we have. The club donated more than $6,000 in time and money to the community last year. It has created its own contests and events, including the annual Freezer Acorns Off in February and Ohio State Parks on the Air, which was used as a model for the ARRL's year-long National Parks on the Air event in 2016. PCARS sponsors several build days each year, with projects including home-built transceivers, antennas, digital equipment to allow members to expand their horizons in the new area of amateur radio. Each month features at least one get-on-the-air day, where members and non-members can use club site equipment to learn about HF and new modes of operation. It is all about building our hobby, helping our community, building our skills, and most of all having fun, PCAR said. And to wrap up our team coverage of the 2018 Hamvention, award winners will go to Chris KB2, FAF, was the Technical Achievement and Special Achievements announcement. Chris? Chip Cohen, W1YW of Belmont, Massachusetts, has been named to receive the Hamvention 2018 Technical Achievement Award. Licensed for 52 years and bitten by the antenna bug, Cohen became a radio astronomer and astrophysicist, working at Arecibo, the National Radio Astronomy Observatory, and the Very Large Array, plus many others. While a professor at Boston University, Cohen connected fractal geometry with antennas, pioneering a paradigm shift in the design of fractal antennas and what they make possible. An inventor with 41 U.S. patents, Cohen is known for inventing the invisibility cloak using fractal antenna techniques. Starting 30 years ago with simple flea market treasures, W1YW bootstrapped fractal antennas with modest gear and employed ham radio to report on the success of his new technology. He started Fractal Antenna Systems Incorporated with WA1ZWT, who's a silent key, in 1995. Cohen is presently the CEO of the company. Cohen is a DXCC top of the honor roll DXer and a strong advocate for technical innovation culture throughout amateur radio. He is a life member of the AWRL and a fellow of the Radio Club of America, where he served as vice president and presently as director. Heriberto Perez, KK4DCX, Victor Torres, WP4SD, and Emilio Ortiz Jr., WP4KEY, are Hamvention's 2018 Special Achievement Award winners. 
In the wake of Hurricane Maria, which devastated Puerto Rico last September, all communication services and utilities collapsed. On September 21st, Perez mobilized his radio equipment to Radio Seoul in San German, the local public broadcasting station, accompanied by Torres and Ortiz. The team handled health and welfare traffic to thousands of families across the continental U.S. Thanks to the support of more than 45 radio amateurs across the United States, more than 4,000 messages were delivered via telephone. All awards will be presented at Hamvention 2018 in Xenia, Ohio, this May. If you like your GPS, you should be worried. A proposal before the Federal Communications Commission would allow transmissions that will block or degrade GPS service for millions of Americans. Over the past 20 years, GPS has become a silent utility upon which most of our infrastructures, as well as daily life, now depends. The benefits of GPS run deep through our society and economy. Its thousands of uses have greatly improved our lives in areas as varied as emergency response, safer air travel and delivery, precision surveying, construction and agriculture using less materials, chemicals and energy, synchronizing wireless networks to enable the continuing cell phone and information technology revolution. In these and many other ways, GPS has become an economic engine for America. A recent study concluded that a small portion of these applications exceed $65 billion a year in benefits. Over half those benefits come from high-precision receivers that routinely measure position to accuracies of better than one inch. While many users could be impacted, high-precision receivers are at most risk from the proposal before the FCC. A U.S. satellite communications company called Legato Networks is seeking FCC approval to transmit at frequencies near those used by GPS to become a national communications provider like Verizon or AT&T. Legato would deploy as many as 40,000 towers across the U.S. and transmit a signal over a billion times more powerful than a GPS signal. If the FCC approves a Legato application, the value of the company's spectrum alone could increase by $10 billion or more. Multiple recent government studies have shown that such transmissions would severely impact many GPS users up to several miles from each tower. Much like driving past a powerful radio station's antenna in your car and getting static on the radio, Legato's high-power signals would bleed over and disrupt GPS receivers, sometimes within miles of the antenna. Although Legato has offered modifications to its proposal over the years in response to potential impact on GPS users, close examination has shown little or no improvement to the disruption its system would cause. Recent legal action by early investors in Legato's predecessor company claims the impact of these transmissions on GPS should have been disclosed as early as 2001. The suit says tests show the transmissions would effectively cripple receivers used by GPS and would be fatal to millions of GPS devices already in use, many of which are critical to the national infrastructure and widely used for aviation, safety, defense, and research purposes. Approval of Legato's application by the FCC could degrade or prevent current GPS receivers for use in aircraft, guidance drones, precision agriculture, timing in cell phone and information networks, and hosts of other applications even as far away as miles in some cases. It would also place today's first responder helicopter and ground operations at risk and could effectively cripple development of budding drone aircraft, autonomous vehicle, and intelligent transportation systems. That's why the administration's National Advisory Board for GPS, along with many others in the GPS community, strongly argued against the Legato proposal and similar earlier proposals of the past eight years. America has four major telecommunications providers and dozens of smaller ones. We have only one GPS. This is Don Hulick reporting K2ATJ. The ARRL's expanded presence at the Orlando Hamcation, held February 9th through the 11th, sanctioned as the 2018 ARRL Florida State Convention, enabled a suitably sized gathering place to meet and greet volunteers from the ARRL Southern Division, including ARRL Director Greg Surrett, W4OZK, and Vice Director Joey Tiratelli, N4ZUW, as well as Section Managers and ARRL Field Organization Volunteers. ARRL President Rick Roderick, K5UR, also met with visitors to the second largest U.S. ham fest. Well-known ARRL honorary officials were also on hand, including Honorary Vice President and former Southeast Division Director Frank Butler, W4RH, former ARRL President Rod Stafford, W6ROD, and ARRL IARU President Emeritus Larry Price, W4RA. Many attendees took advantage of the huge ARRL bookstore, made possible this year by Hamcation's generous support of the ARRL. 
convention goers picked up copies of the popular new and flagship AWRL publications. AWRL staffers Yvette Vinci, KC1AIM, Diane Petrilli, KB1RNF, Barbara Inderbitson, NQ1R, and volunteers Holly Roderick and Sherry Mavaza, KM4VSW, all contributed to the store's operation. Our staff collected membership applications from those wanting to join or renew and return to AWRL headquarters with applications totaling 390 membership years, said Inderbitson, who is AWRL marketing manager. A standing room only crowd attended the AWRL membership forum, moderated by Southeastern Division Greg Claret, W4OZK. President Roderick addressed the forum, highlighting AWRL initiatives and answering questions. Surrett recognized ham radio operators throughout the division and country who help provide public service and emergency communications throughout the 2017 hurricane season and its devastating impact on the Southeast, U.S., Puerto Rico, and the Virgin Islands. Surrett invited AWRL Puerto Rico Section Manager Oscar Resco, KP4RF, and U.S. Virgin Islands Section Manager Fred Kleber, K9VV forward to accept the 2018 AWRL International Humanitarian Award on behalf of amateur radio operators in their sections who aided in relief and recovery following the punishing hurricanes. Many section managers from the Southeastern Division shared updates for their regions and recognized the work of field organization volunteers and appointees. Southern Florida Section Manager Jeff Beals, WA4AW, awarded Mo Dake, K9EE of Lantana, Florida, a Certificate of Merit for his 12 years of service as Palm Beach County Skywarn Coordinator. A display featuring AWRL Collegiate Amateur Radio Initiative included college pennants contributed by a handful of university radio clubs. Andy Maluzzi, KK4LWR, a systems engineer at Walt Disney Parks and Resorts, and a recent doctoral program graduate of the University of Florida, led a college amateur radio forum. He introduced many opportunities to help foster interest in ham radio, among college students and campus radio clubs. Topics Maluzzi and other participants covered include the AWRL scholarships, source of funding for campus radio clubs, and networking students with alumni and professionals. Interbitson also addressed the forum. There's a renaissance going on right now with renewing amateur radio among our nation's colleges and universities, he observed. Interbitson described the AWRL support for college radio clubs by providing opportunity for students faculty advisors, and other supporters to network via the AWRL KARI Facebook group and a Hampfest forums exhibits held through the country. A video of this forum is available on YouTube, produced by Maluzzi brother Tony, KDARTT, a graduate research assistant at Ohio University, who also participated in the CARI forum. The AWRL Collegiate Amateur Radio Initiative is made possible by the W1YSM Snyder Family Collegiate Amateur Radio Endowment Fund. Established for AWRL by Ed Snyder, W1YSM of Wallingford, Connecticut in 2017. A booth and forum for the AWRL CARI program will also be organized for Hamvention in Xenia, Ohio, held this year on May 19th through the 21st. Bring your school colors to hang in the AWRL exhibit area, Andy Maluzzi urged. We'll display your college pennant, flag, or banner to show off the representation of college and university radio clubs at Hamvention. Inder Bitson has posted Hamcation photos on the AWRL Facebook page. Hamcation is held each year at the Central Florida Fairgrounds in Orlando. The Orlando Amateur Radio Club sponsors the event with support from volunteers and clubs throughout the region. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, your amateur radio and technology news magazine of the air. Produced by amateurs, for amateurs, and originating from Albany, New York, you're listening to This Week in Amateur Radio. I'm Steve Ford, WB8IMY, and I'm speaking with Bart Yonke, W9JJ, the ARRL Contest Branch Manager. And Bart, I'd like to know, where do we stand right now with the grid chase? Hey Steve, well, we've just wrapped up February activity. The reporting deadline, by the way, is tomorrow, Saturday, March 10th at 2359 UTC, so that's Saturday evening tomorrow. So be sure to get all your uploads into Logbook of the World. Again, everything that you do um, and to be active in International Grid Chase and for its reporting is uh, contingent on you uploading your logs to Logbook. So remember to do that. Activity was great, Steve, nice and strong in the month of February as well. Again, driven by some of the D-Expeditions that were active, as well as the ARL DXCW contest, which was the third week of February. 
uh, in looking at some of the activity we saw as compared to even January. Again, there was almost 110,000 matched QSOs that were reported wow. to Logbook of the World. That's amazing. And over half of those were digital. Again, uh, during the winter months, the lower bands attracting uh, a propagation, uh, both uh, technique and propagation modes that relied on some of the weaker signal management. Do you so, think a lot of it's FT8? I, I do, definitely. Yeah. Uh, that that And that continues to build for sure. Also, uh, for people looking at some of the statistics, and it's all out there on our leaderboard, uh, by the way, to uh, to look at the International Grid Chase and the leaderboard, take a look at our webpage. That's www.arrl.org forward slash international hyphen grid hyphen chase hyphen 2018. And check out that leaderboard. You can do a bunch of searches, including breaking down the digital modes to see specifically how given digital modes or given phone modes uh, were active during the event. Looks like we had over 22,000 uh contributors to Logbook of the World during the month of February. 22,000. Yep. And from that, over 110,000 QSOs were matched. It means that both parties had to complete uploads and have matching QSOs. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Okay. Well, thank you, Bart. Thank you for the update. Appreciate it, Steve. Again, March contest will bring in another strong month, and we've got propagation on the rise. So get on, have fun, and be sure to upload your logs to Logbook of the World. Absolutely. Are you ready for another trip? into amateur radio history? I'm Bill Continelli, W2XOY, and I'll be back in a moment with another edition of the Ancient Amateur Archives, here on This Week in Amateur Radio. And now, with his segment on working amateur radio satellites, here is AMSAT North America's own Bruce Page, KK5DO. On March 2nd, NASA announced the ninth round of selections for the CubeSat launch initiative, or CSLI. The first two AMSAT Golf CubeSats, Golf T and Golf 1, were among the 21 missions recommended for selection. AMSAT must negotiate and execute a cooperative research and development agreement with NASA for each project to finalize selection. NASA anticipates a sufficient number of launch opportunities, but does not guarantee that all recommended payloads will be launched. Golf T, or the technology evaluation environment, will serve as a rapidly deployable low Earth orbit testbed for technologies necessary for a successful CubeSat mission to a wide variety of orbits. Golf T and the Golf program will provide for the development of the five and dime field programmable gate array software defined radio. We will have more information on the AMSAT Golf program as it becomes available. The target date for launch of Golf T is fourth quarter, 2019. This is Bruce Page, KK5DO. This is Bill Continelli, W2XOY, with Amateur Radio History Headlines. 1952, the FCC allows phone operation on 40 meters, which had been CW only. The 15 meter band is opened. The advanced class is withdrawn from new applicants although present holders can continue to renew in the exclusive 75 and 20 meter phone segments which previously belonged to class A only are now opened to generals and conditionals. Everyone conditional and above has the same privileges. 1953 the FCC starts issuing K calls to amateurs in the 48 states due to the increased ham population. 1954 Depressed and broke from his patent fights with RCA over FM, Major Edwin Armstrong commits suicide. His wife continues the fight, winning the last battle in 1967 when the Supreme Court rules that Armstrong did indeed invent FM. 1955. Technicians are given six-meter privileges to help populate the band and to encourage experimentation. The ARRL and most hams oppose two meters for technician. Wayne Green becomes the editor of CQ magazine. 1956 through 1960. A gradual technical revolution on two fronts. First, transistors find their way into the ham shack, first in power supplies, then audio sections, then receivers, and finally QRP transmitters. 
but most equipment was still 100% tubes. Also, SSB is catching up on AM in terms of popularity. By the 1960s, sideband pulls ahead of AM. This has been Amateur Radio History Headlines with Bill Continelli, W2XOY, for this week in Amateur Radio. Thanks to a joint effort by ARRL and the Vintage Radio Communications Museum of Connecticut, the ARRL is going heavy metal. For more details on this story, we go to Carlo Pereira, KC1HSX, reporting from League Headquarters in Newington. Thanks to a joint effort by ARRL and the Vintage Radio and Communications Museum of Connecticut, or VRCMCT, a Classic Gates BC-1T AM broadcast transmitter will enjoy a second life on the amateur radio bands for occasional use under the call sign W1AW or under the ARRL Headquarters Operators Club sign W1INF. Spearheaded by broadcast engineer Dan Thomas, NC1J, volunteers restored the one kilowatt transmitter to operating condition after obtaining it from the National Capital Radio and Television Museum in Bowie, Maryland. The museum will retain ownership of the transmitter while the league houses and maintains it on loan. The transmitter will be located in the ARRL lab, and Assistant Lab Manager Bob Allison, WB1GCM, said the transmitter could be on the air as W1AW during such operating events as the AM Rally and the Heavy Metal Rally. ARRL turned to AM guru and veteran broadcast engineer Tim Timtron Smith, WA1HLR of Scohegan, Maine, to handle shifting the BC1T from 1340 kHz to the handbands. Various stipulations added a level of complexity to the endeavor. First, the transmitter had to be modified as little as possible, retaining original components. The 833 final amplifier tubes, better suited for broadcast band use, would be retained as would be the inductance heavy tuning circuits. Another requirement, this one set by Smith, ambitiously called for the transmitter to function on 75 as well as on 160 meters. Each RF stage was converted, starting with the Colpitts oscillator, which offered two octal tube sockets to hold broadcast signals and a selector switch. More complicated was changing out feedback and loading capacitors in the oscillator stage, along with the buffer tank circuit. The driver tank circuit was next, removing one half of the windings on the multiple tank, changing some connections, shortening long leads on RF bypass capacitors, and modifying the neutralization circuit were necessary. Initial tests on 250 watts on February 22nd demonstrated the success of the modifications and marked completion of the first phase of a new lease on life for the BC-1T as ARRL's flagship AM amateur band transmitter. I'm Carla Pereira, KC1HSX. Timtron has not only been an AM mainstay on 75 and 40 meters over the years, he's engineered all manner of AM, FM, and HF broadcast transmitters during his extensive career. This combination of familiarity and experience has made him a logical choice to handle the conversion to amateur use of a Gates BC-1T, which once transmitted country music from KPGE in Page, Arizona. The plan was to accomplish the conversion in two phases, with the first to be completed in a few days and include basic crystal-controlled functionality on 160 and 75 meters, the second phase will include adding remote control, relay band switching, and external RF drive for frequency agility to be completed later. As most veteran radio amateurs may recall from their novice license days, an octal socket will accommodate the FT-243 case crystals. In this case, only minor rewiring was needed. The output tuning circuit proved to be the easiest to convert. Parallel capacitors that enabled broadcast band operation were rewired in series to resonate on the amateur bands. A spare inductor, not required for higher frequencies, was repurposed in place as a DC safety shunt. The modulator just needed only minor changes. All changes were documented. It took many volunteers and their resources to make this project come together. Eventually, visitors to ARRL headquarters will be able to see the transmitter on the air and possibly use it by advance request. Allison calls the BC-1T the ambassador. It's an ambassador for the AM mode, reaching out a friendly hand to radio amateurs old and new, he said. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, your amateur radio and technology news magazine of the air. And now with the latest technology news and commentary from Petaluma, California. This Week in Amateur Radio is proud to present Leo Laporte. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. I apologize. I really do. I think we have... 
we uh, the the you know the tech journalism community have really scared people unnecessarily over this specter and meltdown thing so let me tell you a little bit about what i think this is what my opinion first of all the uh, program renee mentioned is a great one to get it's from it's free it's small you download it very quickly uh, it doesn't install anything, so if, when you've done, when you run it, you throw it away. But it does check your status as far as this Spectre and Meltdown issue. Uh, and it's called Inspector, uh, and it's spelled I-N-S-P-E-C-T-R-E, not E-R, R-E. Uh, if you Google Inspector, you, I think the number one search result will be this little program. It's from my friend Steve Gibson. He's my uh, security guru. GRC is his website, grc.com. So if you want to check, because it's hard to tell, frankly. I mean, uh, you know, there's, they don't put up a big sign saying, good, you're fixed. It's hard to know. But this is a very, this is, it's a bad bug because it affects all processors in the last 30 years. So it's bad that way. <laughs> That's 22 years, sorry. It's bad in that respect. But uh, it's a hard thing to take advantage of. Uh, the operating systems and the browsers have been patched in almost every case. Not all, but almost every case. But even if they weren't, it's, it's you know, it's it's a difficult exploit. There are much, much bigger things to worry about on the Internet. Probably the thing to do is what, you, what I recommend anyway, which is update to the degree you're able to. And understand if you're running an older version of the operating system like Windows XP that's not being patched or you're running an old computer four-year-old motherboard that may or may not get patches that you're you know you're running a little bit uh risky but it's i understand it's hard to gauge how much risk there is on a scale of one to a hundred specter meltdown less than one less than one there are much bigger problems out there keep yourself updated keep all your programs updated don't download files from strangers don't click on links in email or messaging programs you know, you get a. I get a lot of emails now with with nothing in the email except a, a link. Now you'd have to be a real nut job to click that link. <laughs> That's not going to be important, even if it looks like the email came from somebody you you knew. It's just the link. Yeah, don't click on that. And and really, only install software that you actively go get right. Uh, and 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 we were talking last show about don't uh, install more software than you use. Don't be one of those software collectors, hoarders that just has to have every program. Even if, if for instance, you, you use Microsoft Office, a lot of people, they just, you know, Microsoft sets it up this way. You just install the whole thing. Are you ever going to use the Access database? If not, don't install it. Not only does it take up space, but any program you install can potentially open a door to bad guys because all programs have flaws. So why install something you don't need? Install only the programs you're going to use, and and I mean you know I'm gonna no I'm gonna use that tomorrow, and from that point on, don't install a program until you need it. If you suddenly need a stopwatch program, okay, and then be very careful about where you get it from. Try to get your software from you know comp big companies, known companies, good companies, and don't get it from strange sites. Get it from the the, the the original company's site. You know if it's from Microsoft, don't get it from Joe's software barn. Get it from Microsoft, and you don't have to worry so much about this. Uh, I, I think we've maybe done a little disservice by overplaying this. It's 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 from a technical perspective a horrendous flaw. But one thing we should also point out on older machines, if there is a patch, it's it's going to slow your machine down a lot. So there's another thing you have to weigh: is it worth slowing it down thirty percent for a, a, an attack that that in all likelihood will never happen? Well, you have to be the judge. I'd say no. If you have a if you have a modern machine within the last year. The fixes for the Spectre and Meltdown don't slow it down appreciably. But on older machines, they do. Pre-Haswell, they really do. So be careful there. Uh, let's see. What else is uh, in the news? Lately, I've been mooking. I'm, I'm kind of excited about this. We Maybe you've heard about MOOCs. Mo what is it? Multiple online courses. Multiple something. User online courses. The idea is... That would be MOOC, but it's not. It's M-O-O-C. The idea is a lot of universities are doing this. They're putting their uh, courses online. If you have a uh, iTunes U on your Mac or your uh, iOS device, you can see courses from Stanford. And MIT has its courseware. A lot of Yale, Harvard, a lot of companies, uh, I'm sorry, colleges, putting these online in many cases completely free. And then, of course, there's the, the kind of the commercial 
uh, MOOCs like Udacity uh, that are courses designed specifically for Udacity. And, you know, I, I love this idea. I mean, it, even Khan Academy, a lot of, lot of high school students looking for help in, in difficult subjects like calculus and physics uh, go to YouTube and they watch Khan Academy videos and they get all the help they need. And they go, wow, this is not so bad. And they, and they excel. What I really like, though, is that kids who can't afford college uh, can, can use these if they're motivated, you know, if they, if, if, if they want to learn. They can use these and get a college education for free. I imagine in time this will become more common. Anyway, I wanted to try it out. Programming's always been a hobby of mine. You probably heard me talk about computer programming in the past. I've been doing it, oh, I don't know, for years since I got my first computer, an Atari 400, back in the late 70s. And, and like a lot of people in my generation, you know, we started. We never were trained. I didn't go to school for it. And then we banged away at it until, you know, you basically you start a program and you bang away at it until it works, sort of, mostly. Not a good process. Not a good way to do it. Started in basic, learned a lot, a lot of the other languages. Actually wrote software for work and, uh, and, and even some freeware that I gave away, open source software. Always enjoyed it. Always had a lot of fun with it. But I, was, but I always felt that had I been more formally trained, I might be better at it. And I've tried myself. I bought a lot of books. In fact, I have many, many books on computer programming. I just, it's a, I almost collect languages. It's a hobby. But usually I don't get more than, a, you know, five or six chapters in. And it gets too daunting and I, and I give up. And I know enough. And I do know enough to write quick and dirty little programs in Python and Perl and Ruby and all the trendy languages out there. Yeah, it's fun. It's a great hobby. It's like doing crossword puzzles. Well, you know, yeah. Or a Sudoku. You know, it's just something to keep your mind occupied. But I found, I thought, I there's a book that I've been recommending to kids uh, when they call and they say, I want to I learn to program. I said, you know, there's lots of ways you can do it. Uh, there's How to Think Like a Programmer, very famous online text. There's a lot of free ways. That's what I like. You can download Python and learn that way. And that would be learning kind of how I did it back in the day, you know, just banging at it till, it, till something works. But there are better ways. There are, especially nowadays, over the years, we've, we've become... I think a, a little bit better understanding of how to write correct software. Now, frankly, I wish we were, you know, this is all, this has been implemented more widely because of one of the reasons we have so many computer viruses and exploits and problems and crashes is because people do just kind of bang on it sometimes. It's hard to get a discipline in your, in your coding. So I tell kids, you should start with a text that was designed uh, at Rice universities used uh, widely in the colleges and high schools around the world called how to design programs and the nice thing about it is the folks who wrote it have put it online i think mit press publishes a, a hardcover of it but they put the, the entire text online and you can you can go to htdp i think it's dot org you can google htdp for how to design programs and find the text and then they teach uh, the in, not in a, some trendy language but in a language designed for beginners it's called beginning student language bsl and you can download that uh, call, uh, a program that'll do that: in Windows, Mac, Linux. It's called Doctor Racket, and actually, it's a it's a, a more powerful language uh, is uh, is in there too. Racket, which is a very powerful full time programming language, but but the beginner student language is nice because it uh, it doesn't have a lot to learn. You don't spend a lot of time learning a language; you spend more time learning what programming is about, how to literally how to design programs. It's a, it's a great book, and I, if you're a kid uh, or somebody who's just kind of interested, maybe want to get professional about it, it's a very good starting point. And because it's all free, you can download it and you can do it in your spare time, But I, and I, which I've done, but I, again, I get stuck around chapter five or six. <laughs> I give up. So I looked around and I found uh, a course taught from the University of British Columbia, UBC, online at a site called edx.org. Org, edx org edx is a uh, online MOOC created by Harvard and MIT, but many other universities uh, have courses on there. And this course, Gregor Kazalis uh, teaches it. He's a very, he's you know, very well known professional, serious programmer and a computer science professor professor at University of British Columbia. They've done a, I think, a great job of putting a course together. You watch videos, take quizzes, there's assignments, there's a discussion group for students, there's students all over the world taking it, which is fun, and it's free. Uh, it, it's, I should get the exact name of it, shouldn't I, so that I can tell you. Let me, uh, let me, let me go over to my login. It's called How to Code Simple Data. 
And actually, it's part of, a, I think, an eight-course series that they give if you pay for it. And I think it's totally 800 bucks, something like that, if you decided. You don't have to pay for it. It's completely free. I paid for it because I want a little certificate at the end. You passed. I hope. <laughs> I hope. Yeah, you get a grade and everything. But uh, you don't have to pay. But if you do pay, and, and if you want to get what they call the micro masters, take all eight courses, which would probably take a good year, you get a certificate. People get hired from this. You could you could start knowing nothing about programming and, and literally teach yourself everything you need through these online courses. It's just, it's amazing. And I, I wish more programmers would. You know, I it, it takes a little bit of uh, ego or not, I guess, humility, the opposite, right? To say, well, I've been programming for 30 years, but I really need to learn how to do it right. But once you do, it's fun. You know, they have all these processes that modern, you know, professional programmers use how to code simple data edx.org org you can take it for free or take a look at the micro masters i don't know if i'll do that it might be fun get a micro masters degree in computer science after all these years uh and i don't i you know it, it it's just a it's a fun hobby how about that but if you're a young person or you're somebody trying to get into uh, what i think is a probably pretty good profession these days computer programming this would be a great way to start leo laporte the Tech Guy. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, your amateur radio and technology news magazine of the air, available online at www.twiar.net. It is mere coincidence that the Titanic disaster in 1912, one of the worst maritime disasters in history, and the birth of Marconi in 1874, the developer of the wireless gear on board the ill-fated ship, both occurred in April. And there is a special event station coming up that you may want to work. The Titanic Marconi Memorial Radio Association of Cape Cod Operation will use W1MGY in recognition of the Titanic's MGY call sign. Operation will begin on Saturday, April 12th at 9 a.m. and continue until April 15th at 1.27 a.m. Eastern Time or 0527 UTC, the time when the Virginian heard Titanic's last radio message 106 years ago. The Titanic disaster claimed some 1,500 lives. The W1MGY operation will be open to the public only on April 14th at 10 a.m. till 3 p.m. Eastern Time. According to W1MGY trustee Barry Hutchinson, KB1TLR, plans call for coverage on all bands, mostly within the general class subbands on CW and single sideband. Two stations are planned. Marconi's wireless station in Wellfleet on Cape Cod played a role in the rescue of 740 survivors from the Titanic. Marconi's wireless operator on board the rescue ship Carpathia contacted the Titanic that fateful night to inform the wireless operator that the Cape Cod station was transmitting messages to the ill-fated ship. The Titanic's Marconi wireless operator promptly replied, Come at once, we have struck a berg, initiating the rescue of survivors. Today, the Wellfleet Station site is listed as a national landmark on the National Register of Historic Places and is now part of Cape Cod National Seashore. Saturday, April 21st, International Marconi Day, or IMC, operation by the Marconi Cape Cod Radio Club will use the call sign KM1CC, which recognizes the former WCC shore station on Cape Cod. Operation will be on CW, single sideband, and digital modes. KM1CC will be among many stations participating in IMD activities on April 21st. The 24-hour event is typically held on the Saturday closest to Marconi's birth date. During IMD, amateur radio enthusiasts around the world will attempt to make contact with various historic Marconi sites using communication techniques similar to those that Marconi used. Registered stations must operate from a site with some connection to Marconi. Stations may register for International Marconi Day 2018 via email. The list of stations already signed up for the 2018 IMD, along with their operating sites, is posted on the Cornish Radio Amateur Club website. Foundations of Amateur Radio There is some truth in simplicity. I've mentioned in the past that Suckered and See is a perfectly valid solution to figuring out if something is going to work or not. I've moved into my new home, my new QDH. 
The roof is colour bond. That's basically a corrugated iron roof, painted in some random colour. I think it's grey, but don't quote me on that, could be green. Inside is a mezzanine floor, essentially carving out a space within the roof area. It's going to be my office and radio shack. So after setting up technology, I had a spare 15 minutes and came across a box that had my radio bits inside it. After setting up power, I went and combed through some more crates to locate a magnetic mount and the vertical I use on 2 meters and 70 centimeters in my car. The roof beam is held up by a steel post, which forms part of the railing that surrounds the mezzanine floor. All conventional wisdom tells me that this is a poor place for an antenna. So, undeterred with little else in the way of simple options, I stuck my magnetic mount to the steel post with my vertical attached. Of course, this doesn't mean that I have my vertical actually mounted vertically. In fact, it's not. It's horizontal. So, there's one of two steel posts that holds up the steel roof, a magnetic mount stuck to the side of the post with the vertical running horizontally. It keyed up the local repeater the first time, made some contacts, spoke to three local amateurs to confirm that they could in fact hear me, swapped sides on the post from parallel to the roof line to 90 degrees off the side with some improvement. Now, as I said, on paper, this shouldn't work. The roof beam runs north-south, the repeater is off to the east of the pitched roof, so the signal isn't making its way off the ends. It's going through the roof, or I've managed to use the roof post as an antenna, or the roof, or both, or the signal is bouncing down over a metal fence, who knows. The point is, it works, when anyone you'd have asked about this would have rightly told you that it won't. When I asked recently what the ideal shack should look like, one person who travelled a lot pointed out that just enough shack is a good place to start. Right now, I'm a power supply, radio and a horizontally mounted vertical into the minimal shack. I was asked if I'd tested HF yet. Seriously, the radio is 15 minutes out of the box, but in a word, yes. I put on a 10 metre vertical, also mounted horizontally, same magnetic mount, and I can hear the local beacon on 10 metres, 12 metres and 15 metres. A vast improvement on my previous HF experiences at home. Overall, the noise on the band seems less than it was in my old house. This could be because of shielding of the roof, or it could just be less actual noise, or because my antenna is mounted horizontally. Previously, I had S9 noise. Now it peaks at S5, but on average it's around S2 to 3. It's not a proper test by any stretch of my imagination, and while initial indicators are better, this is by no means a definitive test of the HF band. For my next trick, I'll be taking a closer look at the railing that surrounds my office. It's made from stainless steel stranded wire, the stuff you find on a boat, with seven strands to choose from, in three separate orientations. So, plenty of room for experimentation, and more if I dare to use the strands on the staircase. Seriously, I won't be. One thing I will do before I start keying up for the next HF contact, is do some electromagnetic radiation research, to learn if I'm in the danger zone or if my family might be exposed to unsafe levels of RF radiation. Normally this isn't an issue with 5 watts when the antenna is on a roof, but now I have it indoors, I'll spend some time making sure. I still have a magnetic loop on loan from a friend, packed away in a box, that I'll unearth in the next couple of days, to see what it has to say about the new RF environment. As I said, this is just the beginning, and I've not yet been calling CQ or checking out the local HF nets. What crazy setups do you admit to that actually worked, even though they shouldn't have? I'm Ono, Victor Kilo 6, Foxtrot Lima, Alpha Bravo. I'm Steve Ford, WB8IMY, and this is the propagation forecast for Friday, March 9th. There are no sunspots visible at the moment, and the solar flux index is hovering around an anemic 68. Under these conditions, the best HF bands for DX this weekend are the ones below 20 meters. A stream of solar particles is due to reach us today and over the weekend, but the chance of a geomagnetic storm is forecast to be less than 50%. On VHF and UHF, hams in the upper Midwest are enjoying band openings on 2 meters and up. Strong activity is also being reported in central Texas and northern Florida. You're listening to North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine of the air. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, distributed worldwide at TWIAR.net. More about the life of Thomas Hood, NW7US. From the suburban Chicago studio of the Radio Amateur Information Network, I'm Larry McGlure, KB9DIP, with the first rain report for March 2018. 
I've always told people, even though there's a science of propagation, it's still fun to go dangle your feet in the water, cast your line and see if you get something. Get on a band, even if you don't hear anything, and try a few calls. Stay there at least 10 minutes calling CQ because somebody else may be tuning across going, huh, I wonder if the band's open today. And they'll be tuning across and they'll hear you. If everybody's listening, you'll never know there's an opening. The voice of Thomas Hood, NW7US, whose life story we've been excerpting from an interview Eric Guth, 4Z1UG, conducted with Thomas. This is our second and final excerpt from that hour-long conversation. Back to that Sony portable radio and my first exposure to WWV and their solar and terrestrial condition bulletin every hour. When I discovered the sun and how it's a variable star and that things are always changing, it captivated my imagination for my whole life. When I learned about the ionosphere and the magic of a signal emanating from an antenna and refracted or bounced off of the sky, for me as a kid, gave me a chance to travel the world without leaving home. And that was all through that magic of the ionosphere. So it captivated me for my entire life. I got every book that I could possibly find on the topic and there weren't many, but I would try to absorb whatever I could. After the Connecticut, so I was part of a ham radio club there. It might have been out of Hartford, but I'm not sure now. But there were, were people there that could explain to me what's going on with the ionosphere and propagation and how radio waves travel. And I was so in love with that, that when I first got onto the internet and the World Wide Web, I tried to search through the limited search features that were on the internet at the time. I, I'm an early adopter, so I was on the internet as soon as it was a thing. There were no websites that talked about this stuff. It clicked in my mind that it's time for me to give back to the amateur radio community and to the shortwave listening community, the wealth of information that I've gained over the years. And how can I give that back? But through a website of my own. And I put the first amateur slant shortwave listening propagation website on the internet. So I'm the first and I can prove that because some people have challenged me on that. I'm definitively the first amateur non-government outlet for space weather and radio propagation. And that was hfradio.org. I've got a second domain, sunspotwatch.com, because that was better as a name for that segment of my website at the time. It sorely needs overhaul at the moment, but I just don't have the time to do that. I'm probably going to hire somebody to help redesign the website. But long story short, when I got a web page and I began posting forecasts and data, I began to have a following. Unbeknownst to me, the original CQ Amateur Radio Magazine's propagation contributing editor, George Jacobs, came across that website and began researching me a little bit. When he retired from being the editor of that column, Rich Moseson at CQ Magazine, that I was one of the candidates that he would suggest replace him as writer of that column. So out of the blue, I get this email from Rich, and he said, hey, do you have time for a phone call? I have a proposal for you. And I thought, okay. He introduced what CQ Magazine. I wasn't a subscriber at the time of CQ. I only had the QST. And he described the magazine. He described the column. He said that George Jacobs is retiring and uh, suggested me as a successor. I was thrilled. I thought, wow, I've gone from giving back through a website to the potential of actually writing about this and educating amateur radio operators, the stuff that I've learned throughout my life. What a great opportunity. For the first three editions, I co-wrote with George. More and more took over the column. Rich was happy with my writing. George was happy. George retired. He did it for 50 years, if I'm not mistaken. He never missed an issue, not once. Like, what, 2001 or something like that? And I have missed a couple of editions, surgery, and I missed a couple of columns. But I just am still, to this day, thrilled that I have some opportunity to give back to the amateur radio and shortwave listening community because they gave me, in my opinion, so much in the beginning, so much Elmering insight to amateur radio. Two different people give me rigs to inspire me to get on the air and operate. And that was love for the hobby, an act of love for the communication community to give me radios like that. You know, I was young. I didn't have the, the ability to afford those things. 
and I just feel this is my calling to give back to the community. You mentioned your two websites, hfradio.org and sunspotwatch.com. Are there other resources available on the Internet to help a ham better understand what the happenings are in the universe and how it affects band openings and closings? After about 2005 onward, I would say there was an explosion of different online resources coming in into the, the sphere of radio and propagation and space weather. You've got the governmental agencies, uh, the ESA, the IPS out of Australia, of course, the, the NASA and the uh, Space Weather Prediction Center. These are greatly funded now. Government agencies have a repository of official data and subscience. Not Radio Australia, but the IPS uh, in Australia, they've got some educational material, of course, read every page. And there's been a lot of community efforts to enhance through the Wikipedia pages. Of course, a lot of my competitors that are out there doing their take on space weather and the science of radio propagation. There's also YouTube is out there competing for, for your time. The thing that really gets under my skin is that there's a lot of misinformation out there still, perpetuated. One source, it sounds credible. They don't go and research to see if it's true. And there's a lot of myths still being perpetuated in the amateur radio community or the community at large, the public about things space weather related. For instance, you'll hear on the nightly news or you'll hear some amateur on an 80 meter or 75 meter round table gathering in the evening, you'll hear this phrase, the sun has erupted with a solar flare that'll hit us in a couple of days and probably will make HF unusable. Okay, let's dissect that for a moment. A solar flare is an instantaneous explosion of up energy stored in the magnetic structures of the sun. When this burst of energy is released, instantaneous emission throughout the radio and light spectrum. Well, it takes approximately eight minutes for light to go from the sun to the earth. By the time we detect that a solar flare has occurred, we have already seen eight minutes go by in our time. We have some spacecraft that are in between the sun and the earth, so it may be that five minutes out or seven minutes out, that satellite already detected it. Here, somebody in the evening on 80 meters saying a solar flare has occurred and it's going to hit us in three days. Well, they're not factual in that estimation. It's already occurred. That light's already hit the earth. The effect of that solar flare has already impacted the ionosphere within that eight-minute window. But what they're referring to is artifacts that are related to the solar flare, but not always to a solar flare. And that's the emission of plasma and plasma clouds that take a lot longer to get to the Earth. And it could take up to three days for the plasma cloud to ride the solar wind and then interact with the magnetosphere and affect our local terrestrial environment. That may come up to three days later. Kind of gray when people talk about space weather. So I have a mission in my columns my website, my YouTube videos, to try to explain how the science really works. And the reason that's important for a DXer to get on the radio and just start hunting, that's fun. It's like taking your fishing pole, taking your tackle, taking different kinds of bait, going down to the local watering hole, casting a line and hoping that you get a bite, and spending a few hours there dangling your feet in the water. That's fun. It's relaxing. It's great. You're listening to a conversation Eric Guth, 4Z1UG, had with Thomas Hood, NW7US, a propagation writer known worldwide for his ability to break down the complexities of solar propagation. We'll conclude this conversation with Thomas in a moment. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, your amateur radio and technology news magazine of the air. If you have a limited window of time and you've got to feed your family and you want to go out and catch some fish, you might want to think about how can I best utilize my time? When's the best time to go get that fish? Where's that fish actually hanging out? What bait is really, there's a bit of skill there and a bit of science. People plan for their fishing trip and then they go out and if they're successful, they put food on the table. It's kind of the same thing in radio. The expedition, for instance, there's a lot of planning that goes in as to when they will operate on what band, which antenna, what direction. There's all that science. They'll be successful as a de-expedition and maximize the opportunity for the extras around the world to make contact with that de-expedition. So if they understand space weather, 
and understand what forecasting is telling them will happen, what time of year and the statistical variances of the ionosphere, they'll be better equipped with navigating target areas and, and operations. That's why I'm so passionate about this. I'm trying to help people understand these things. Well, we're at the bottom of the uh, solar cycle. The bands are supposed to be dead for the most part. Are they dead for the most part? We discovered during the last solar minimum, which was an extended one, to such an extended long, low period, years, like four or five years of marginal, if any, sunspot activity. I mean, we went months without one single sunspot. Everybody thought going into that, that, yeah, the bands are going to be dead. It's not going to be possible to really enjoy HF. Start learning how to use a repeater. Start learning the VHF side of things because, man, you'll never get anything on HF. Well, that was proven wrong. First, anything below 20 meters can have good propagation with or without sunspots, especially when you get down to about 7 megahertz or below. You'll always have propagation even if there's no solar activity energizing the ionosphere. It's just the science of the chemistry in the atmosphere and that there's going to be a strong enough ionosphere that up to 7 megahertz is going to propagate even if the ionosphere is low energy mode or, or condition. So we're talking 40 meters, 60 meters, 80 meters, 160 meters. I mean, so. Exactly. Things that people consider as a nighttime ban. Well, those will always work because there's no sun involved in nighttime propagation, really. I mean, there's a little bit of residual effect, but there's no direct sunlight. So whatever we experience on those bands, that's going to be always there no matter what part of the sunspot cycle we're in. But the ionosphere is this tricky thing. Even though we know sunspot activity correlates with ionospheric density and layer thickness, etc., there's also the terrestrial science of the ionosphere. And we're talking about temperature inversions, we're talking about thunderstorms, different phenomena that can stir up the ionosphere and change its dynamics. The ionosphere, for instance, is not just a flat mirror surface. It's more like a bunched up silk cloth, very textualized. So you'll have, even during sunspot minimum, we had 10 meter openings that weren't sporadic E, but were other types of modes that were enhanced by maybe aurora or other types of things. And there's propagation possible. It's still fun to go dangle your feet in the water, cast your line and see if you get something. You gotta actually get a signal out there, cast a line, and discover that maybe there's an opening. If everybody's listening, you'll never know there's an opening. Whisper mode, WSPR by Joe Taylor, is one of those modes where you can have transmissions going on a band to ferret out how the propagation's turning out on a band. There are other modes now that are very active, but Whisper was a revolutionary thing. A PSK net was another effort, especially on 10 meters, for people to understand the openings that go on. And PSK net revealed a lot of what's capable on 10 meters during a solar minimum. So they were instrumental in, in gathering data. The sporadic E that's prevalent in the summer in North America is a fine example of how 10 meters can still be very active during a sunspot minimum, yet still give you lots of opportunity on 10 meters. 10 meters being at the very top of the radio spectrum, you have to have sunspot activity, a lot of sunspot activity for that band to be operable. But it's not the case. Sporadic E, some aurora effects, transactorial propagation, different modes are all possible on 10 meters in those higher bands. So yeah, radio is red hot, they said back in the 70s and 80s. I'm wondering the reason that people are having so much success with the digital modes. Well, not only because the digital modes are, are clever and they can recover a signal way down in the noise, but they're kind of beaconing. They're sending CQ when for the digital modes, people would say, oh, the band's dead. They were all listening, but they weren't sending CQ. The people that are having great success with the digital modes are having that success because they're actually transmitting. Yep. Same thing happens during a contest. People discover the bands are alive during contests, but they're not alive when there's no contest. Well, how can that be? Is it because all these signals were in the ionosphere? No. It's just because they're actually on the band throwing out that signal that can be heard by somebody. You have a link on your uh, website to the current aurora oval. What is an aurora oval? And how and where does it affect propagation? The Earth is an amazing planet, and we've discovered that other planets are very much like Earth, in that the Earth 
kind of like a bar magnet. You've got a North Pole and you've got a South Pole. And if you remember from grade school or perhaps junior high in America here, the science teacher that would have the iron fillings on a piece of paper and underneath the paper or a cardboard box, they would take a bar magnet and they would write underneath those metal filings. And lo and behold, we see magnetic lines emanating from each pole, kind of like a donut. The Earth has the same magnetic environment. Well, the solar wind, which always emanates from the sun in what's called a Parker spiral, if you've seen a sprinkler in a yard, that goes around and around with like three or four arms spraying out these constant streams of water. As it's going around, those streams of water are curved. Well, the solar wind is this curved plasma and magnetic field line flow of energy out of the sun. And that interacts with the Earth's magnetic field. When magnetic fields that ride the solar wind interact with the magnetic fields of the Earth, sometimes there's a connection, like think of the two bar magnets, where you have north and when you go as both so that one north is pointing to the south of the other, they connect. If you go north to north, they repeal, like charges repeal, they say. So the Earth and the Sun kind of have this interaction through the solar wind of these magnetic interplays. If the solar wind is oriented in such a way that it connects with the Earth's magnetic field, it's like opening a window. The space plasma coming out of the sun, solar wind, goes through that connection into the Earth's magnetic field, continues to ride the Earth's magnetic field, which, as you know, comes down at the poles. So all this plasma is raining down these magnetic lines and coming closer and closer to the Earth. Well, the aurora is a reaction or an interplay between the molecules and the plasma. The plasma comes in, bombards these molecules, and forces electrons out of orbit, emitting light. So the aurora is this beautiful display of how our atmosphere interplays with solar plasma. A shield, it protects us. This magnetic field actually is a force field that protects us. The ionosphere formed by the chemistry and magnetic interplay of those molecules and electrons in, in our atmosphere form this shield that protects us both from extreme ultraviolet as well as that plasma. And the aurora is like a rainbow in a different way, a testimony of this protection that we have around us. Beautiful. Not only is it visually beautiful, but the concept that we can live on this planet so close to the sun, protected by this force field around us, that's a beautiful display of our existence. Something to celebrate. And that concludes one of the more interesting interviews we've excerpted in some time. We heard two excerpts from an hour-long conversation between Eric Guth, 4Z1UG, and Thomas Hood, NW7US, excerpted with permission. I'm Larry McGlure, KB9DIP, bidding you a very 73. We are This Week in Amateur Radio, your amateur radio and technology news magazine of the air, available online at www.twiar.net. Now safely home in the wake of their ill-fated de-expedition attempt to Bouvet Island, the members of the 3Y0Z Bouvet Island team hope to try again to mount an operation from what's been described as the most remote place on Earth. The sub-Antarctic Bouvet, a Norwegian dependency, stands as the second most wanted DXCC entity. We are not the kind of people to give up, the expedition co-leader Bob Alfin, K4UEE, said in a statement released over the weekend. The same thing happened when we were trying to activate Peter Island in 2005. We came back the following year and we got it done. The 2006 3Y0 X-ray operation subsequently was judged the de-expedition of the decade. All told, the 3Y0Z team spent a month aboard the MV Betanzos, the vessel that transported them from Chile to less than a mile off Beauvais to Cape Town, South Africa. Now back home for about two weeks, the team has little time to reflect. We've been to Beauvais Island, and as a result, we have a better appreciation for the challenges we face, Alfin said. It is a dark, dismal, and dangerous place. Yet when the sun shines, it is magnificent. The most difficult memory for the team, Alfin said, is the team's final day off the coast of Beauvais when we saw the island crystal clear in calm winds less than a mile away. 
The conditions were perfect for our first reconnaissance flight and possible landing of men and camp infrastructure, but during the violent night before, the captain had made the decision to abort. In retrospect, his call was clairvoyant. The mechanical propulsion failure on the ship that occurred would have brought disaster if it resulted in some of our men being stranded ashore. Alphen said the 3Y0Z Beauvais team is optimistic that it will get at least some of its money back from the DAP, the Chilean company that owns the vessel. That money, with what we still have in the bank, will allow us to begin making plans to try again, he said. We have begun the difficult task of looking for a suitable vessel and would hope to go back to Beauvais in the next year or two. He said no contributors have asked for their donations back, and several have urged the team to roll over their contributions to help fund the next attempt to activate Beauvais. So, if we could pull the all moving parts together, we are going to try it again, hopefully this time with a different outcome, Alphen concluded. Alphen, Ralph Fedor, K0IR, Erling Wig, LA6VM, have served as co-leaders for the 3Y0Z effort. The 2018 3Y0Z team totals 20 radio amateurs, including the co-leaders from eight different nations, and includes some of the world's top operators. After taking place in late June for many years, Germany's Ham Radio 2018 Exhibition, Europe's largest amateur radio gathering, has become a bit of a moving target. This year's show will shift from June 1st through June 3rd in conjunction with the 69th Lake Constance Convention, both organized by the Deutscher Amateur Radio Club and the separate Maker Fair. The Messe Friedrichshafen Convention Center will be the venue for all three. In 2017, when the events were held in mid-July, the combined visitors for Ham Radio and the Maker Fair amounted to more than 17,000 people. President Rick Roderick, K5UR, will head ARRL's contingent to Ham Radio 2018, which will also include ARRL International Affairs Vice President Jay Bellows, K0QB, Marketing Manager Bob Inderbitzen, NQ1R, Field Services and Radio Sport Manager Norm Fusaro, W3IZ, and Radio Sport Administrative Manager Sabrina Jackson. On hand for the International Amateur Radio Union will be IARU President Tom Ellum, VE6SH slash G4HUA, Vice President Oli Garbestad, LA2RR, and Technical Representative Dale Hughes, VK1DSH. An informal international meeting of AARU Membership Society was set for June 1st. Germany will also host World Radio's Teams Championship 2018, July 12th through the 16th. The National Science Foundation, or NSF, has announced that a management change is underway at the Arecibo Observatory in Puerto Rico. The University of Central Florida has begun formal transition activities to assume the operations and management of the Arecibo Observatory, which sustained significant damage during Hurricane Maria last September. The university will take over formal management and execute a program of research and education consistent with the objectives and priorities of the scientific community, NSF said. The university will provide support and technical personnel to manage the observatory, its research, and educational activities. One of the most significant and largest telescope facilities available to researchers, Arecibo Observatory is home to the Arecibo Observatory Radio Club, KP4 Alpha Oscar. It's been reported that NSF has been looking to scale back its support for Arecibo. UCF said it plans major improvements for the observatory. Under a cooperative agreement with NSF, UCF will head a new consortium comprising Universidad Metropolitana in San Juan and Yang Enterprises, a Florida company that will oversee the 54-year-old observatory. Currently, the Independent Research Center, SRI International, UMET, and the University Space Research Association manage Arecibo in cooperation with NSF, which will gradually reduce its role and funding over the next five years. The new contract officially begins on April 1st. NSF currently supports the Arecibo Observatory to the tune of approximately $8 million a year. Repairs after damage by Hurricane Maria and upgrades to expand the capabilities are high on the to-do list. The facility's iconic dish is 305 meters, or about 1,000 feet in diameter, and has an EIRP of 2.5 terawatts pulsed at 430 megahertz. The observatory will provide a valuable new dimension to space science at UCF while creating more academic opportunities for students and faculty at UCF in Puerto Rico and beyond. This agreement made possible through partnerships also ensures that the observatory will continue to make significant contributions to space science and mankind. The agreement is valued at $20.15 million. 
U.S. Senator Bill Nelson of Florida called the new contract a win-win. Nelson supported UCS bid to manage Arecibo and recently helped secure funding in Congress to repair damage to the telescope caused by Hurricane Maria. It's good for UCF in Florida, it's good for Puerto Rico, and it will enable thousands of scientists who do research at the Arecibo each year to continue their work, Nelson said. And finally this week, United States shortwave broadcast giant WBCQ, The Planet, announced this week that it is building one of the most powerful and versatile radio stations in the world. WBCQ's new shortwave radio station, now under construction in Monticello, Maine, features a new 500-kilowatt transmitter from Continental Electronics and a state-of-the-art antenna system from Ampagon Antenna of Switzerland. The new station, funded by private investors, will be able to direct a powerful shortwave signal to any country on Earth. The new facility is planned to be a showcase for the radio world and is dedicated to our free speech mission. The new station is planned to commence operation in the fall of 2018. WBCQ is an international shortwave broadcast station located in Monticello, Maine, in the United States, and broadcasts on 7.490 MHz, 9.330 MHz, 5.130 MHz, and 3.265 MHz. This Week in Amateur Radio is heard on nets and repeaters all across North America and around the world on great repeater systems like our flagship repeater, K2CT, on 145.19 MHz in New Scotland, New York, owned and operated by the Albany Amateur Radio Association. Many of the news and information items heard on This Week in Amateur Radio have been provided by the American Radio Relay League, the ARRL Letter, AMSAT, the Radio Amateurs of Canada, amateur radio newsletters from around the world, sources on the internet, and the packet bulletin board systems of the United States and Canada. This Week in Amateur Radio is produced by Community Video Associates Incorporated, a New York State nonprofit corporation. If you would like to become an affiliate, submit news items, send us comments about the weekly amateur radio bulletin service, or just to support us please get in contact with us via our Facebook page. Just log into Facebook and search for the group This Week in Amateur Radio. You can also find us on Twitter at twitter.com slash TWIAR. For program audio, archives, and the latest amateur radio news, visit our website at TWIAR.net. This Week in Amateur Radio version 2.0 is produced and distributed under a Creative Commons non-commercial share-alike license. Now, for the staff of This Week in Amateur Radio, this is Jessica Bowen, KC2VWX, saying 73 until next week.